Hello. Um, so I thought I'd talk about free will a little bit and just sort of set up the what what we call the, the problem of free will. Um, this is just sort of the classic um, notion. Um, and as some of you are doing your reading, uh, obviously um, you're coming to see that there's a wide range of um, directions you can take in terms of, of, of free will. Um, there's probably been more ink spilled over free will over the past you know, 2,400 years than, than maybe just about any other subject. Um, and all this time later, uh, we're still for the most part faced with the exact same problems. Uh, so let's talk about um, sort of three ways to, to, to look at this. Um, let's start from our common experience of the world. Now, if you saw an object, say this marker, if you saw this object, you know, no one's around, there's no strings, there's no tricks or anything. If you just saw the object just move, the question is, is how willing would you be to say that that object, this marker, moved just by itself? That nothing caused it to move, um, there were no reasons for it moving, it just moved. The chances are you're not going to be really willing to accept that um, because that's not how we interpret the world. Um, we interpret the world in such a way such that an event happens because some other antecedent event um, caused it to happen. And in a strict sense, such that had the antecedent event not happened, then this wouldn't have happened. Um, your, your car turns on because you put the key in it, because you got into the car, because you left your apartment to get into the car to turn the key, and so on and so on. The car doesn't just start. Or if the car just started, then it would have been because of some faulty wiring or something like that. So we don't interpret the world in a way such that things just happen. Just on a day-to-day -day basis, bumping in, into each other and, and so on. Um, and this tells us something particular. This tells us uh, at least, I think, a few things. One is that we interpret a world such that um, causes precede an effect. Uh, some phenomena or whatever, that a cause precedes an effect. You don't have an effect and then the cause. You have the cause and then the resulting effect. Um, this tells us also that causes are for or have certain effects or a certain range of effects. That right now my movement of my hand might cause something to happen, it'll cause air molecules to move, or it might cause someone to think I'm saying hi to them or something. But it's not going to cause World War III, for example. Or my moving of the hand isn't going to cause um, world hunger to end or something like that. So causes have specific effects. So it tells us these, our everyday thinking of the world tells us that causes precede effects and that causes have a certain range of effects. Certain causes for certain effects. But it doesn't stop there. We also, when we think of the past, of what's happening now at any given present moment, if we think that a cause precedes that effect, and so when this happens, this causes this to happen, and by the time this happens, this is already in the past, and the past is fixed. And so this would have been caused by something else in the past, in the past, in the past. And so long as the past is fixed, which we normally take to be that you can't change the past, then what this indicates is that if the past is fixed, if causes precede effects, 
and causes are for certain effects, then what you have is the notion that the past determines the future. The future is a certain way, not could be or might be, but is a certain way because the past is a certain way. Now, if what we mean by free will is something like the ability to have done otherwise than what you did, then this idea uh, that we just talked about, our basic conception of the everyday world, seems to undermine any notion of free will. And this position is known as determinism. Um, let's look at it in a different light. Let's say from a theological perspective. If you've ever seen an ad or maybe a billboard as you're driving by the freeway, it's usually an anti-abortion uh, uh, ad. And it usually has something like a little baby. Um, and then it'll be a quote from the little baby that says, God knew me before I was born. Um, at any rate, this becomes a common um, story that we tell about God. That God is omniscient, meaning all-knowing, omnipotent, all-powerful, and a creator. Not just a creator, but the creator. Let's take that first one, omniscience. Quite literally, it means all-knowing, sentia, from the Latin meaning to know. Uh, omni, of course, meaning all. So all-knowing. And what's, what that classically means is knowledge of past, present, and future. Now ask yourself, if that's true, and if God in fact does know the future, then 50 years from now, when you say, I don't know, murder someone or forget to pay your taxes, presumably God isn't going to be surprised. If God's all-knowing, then God's not going to be shocked that you murder someone. Partly because one of the reasons why God would be all-knowing is that God would have created everything, including the future. Now, again, if God knows the future and knows what you are going to do, not what you could do or what you might do, but in fact what you will do, then the question remains, where does this leave any notion of free will? So that when you quote-unquote choose to say register for that class next semester if God already knew you were going to do that then ask yourself could you have done otherwise would you be able to surprise God and the same old story is no the same old story is that God doesn't get to be surprised because God would be omniscient but if that's true again then where does this leave any notion of free will? The ability to have done otherwise. Um, this is also determinism. This is just a theological perspective. Um, some fancy terms will say um, it would be um, uh, religious, nat uh, re uh, religious naturalism, that sort of thing. Um, but it doesn't matter. In both cases, there are cases of determinism, the case where the future is determined to be a certain way. One, you can get determinism without God. One, you can get determinism with God. So with or without God, you still have the basic problem of determinism. All right, now these are common stories that we tell uh, ourselves. Some people believe the sort of purely naturalistic sense. Some believe the supernatural uh, sense in which God exists. And these are our common everyday stories. Now currently, our current physics tells us, our physics of, of, of quantum mechanics, quantum physics, tells us that at the base fundamental level of reality, that the micro level of reality is completely indeterministic. That particles pop into and out of existence completely randomly. That there is no ebb and flow. It's just this sporadic um, pattern of, of, of activity. Completely unpredictable. 
Um, you can look into it. It has to do with the nature of uh, specifically electrons and the indeterminacy of a position of a system. Uh, in other words, uh, electrons uh, are known to have a spin. Uh, it's referred to as spin up or spin down. And since you can't directly measure electrons, uh, because they in fact pop out of existence and into existence when you look at them, um, they're said to be in a state of superposition, meaning simultaneously occupying state spin up and spin down. In other words, the state of any given system at any given time is completely indeterminate. Not uncertain, but indeterminate, meaning unable to tell what state the system is in. In this case, the universe, the, the base fundamental level of reality. And this is our best current science. Now, this isn't common sense, like the other two stories we, we, we might have said, um, or at least the, the naturalism uh, part. This is sort of deep theoretical reasoning, and it's the best reasoning we have about the physical nature of the universe. And it tells us, unlike determinism, it tells us the world is completely determined in, in its base sense. Um, there is an aspect of this where people want to derive deterministic laws from indeterministic behavior. Uh, but you're free to look at that, but we're not going to get into this. We just want the basic sort of thinking here. Now, if this is true, if the universe is completely indeterministic, then one has to ask oneself, what place is there for free will in that world? Because at the base level, if everything is indeterministic, if all actions are indeterministic, then that would mean that somehow your actions, even your thoughts, the actions of your thoughts and desires and beliefs and so on, uh, as well as your sort of bodily actions, would be a result of indeterministic workings at the basic fundamental level of reality. And again, you might question, what place does this leave us for something like free will, the ability to have done otherwise. Another way of thinking of indeterminism is complete randomness, complete and utter unpredictability. And so in a state of complete randomness, in a true state of randomness, one of the possibilities of complete randomness is a world in which things seem absolutely ordered and determined where cause and effect is at work in that universe and yet each individual event is completely separate from every other event in other words there is no causal um, um, chain that's a possibility in a completely random universe and what would that universe look like? like this one and so cause and effect in an indeterministic universe would be an illusion. And yet you can't rescue free will from it because in that universe your choices would have been just as random as any other choice. Um, and so you seem to lose the notion of free will as well. So on the one hand we have reason to believe that the world is deterministic. On the other hand we have reason to believe the world is indeterministic both make sense. Um, we have elaborate explanations for both ways and both seem to undermine the notion of free will. And this is so what is known as the problem of free will. Um, can you make legitimate free choices in a world that's determined or indeterminate? Whether that determinism is from God, or whether that determinism is without God, doesn't seem to matter. What matters is that the world is deterministic and the future is going to be a certain way. Or in the indeterministic world, um, how do you rescue free will when everything is completely random? Again, this is what is known as the problem of free will. Now there's various ways of, of, of answering this. I'm not saying anyone's right or anyone's wrong. Um, and, and this is only one way of looking at free will. But just to give you an idea of the direction you can go as you're doing your reading and, and snooping around on the internet. And, and so this is very much your activity that you need to sort of settle for yourself. 
at least for the assignment, for the final assignment. Um, one possible way to answer this is to say that maybe even the question of free will is incoherent. Maybe the very notion of free will is incoherent in the type of universe that we have. And so you could elaborate why even asking that question would be, would be a pointless question. Um, another actually fairly popular way of dealing with the question is to point to the difference between freedom of choice and freedom of action. So I think all of us can agree that we live in a universe such that you don't necessarily get to, uh, to act completely freely. There's some actions you can't do. Take um, a video game. This is an example of a, a, a former student, or not a former student, but a current student. Um, in some video games, you are not allowed to perform certain actions that you want to. Now, in that situation, there seems to be a clear difference between the Let's take, I think the example was Grand Theft Auto V, and um, uh, the guy wanted to steal one of the cars, but was unable to do so because I guess he had too many people with him, um, and that car wouldn't allow that theft. So, so he was not actually allowed to steal that car in the game, even though that's what he chose to do. So he chose to do something, presumably freely, and yet could not freely act on, on that choice or take a, a drug addict. Um, I dare say most drug addicts, like the, the sort of the serious hardcore drug addicts, typically don't want to do the drugs because they realize the, the, the effects of it and so on. It's ruining their life and, and whatever. And yet they are nevertheless compelled by their you know, other desires, maybe their physical desires rather than their sort of mental desires, their rational desires, they are nevertheless compelled to take the drugs. And so despite their having chosen not to, the choice is separate from the action. And so they end up taking the drugs um, through no choice of their own. They're compelled to because, say, their body forces them into it and so on. So some people want to make the distinction between uh, freedom of choice and freedom of action and so on. Um, there's all sorts of other directions you can take. I urge you to look at some of the links in that, um, that piece on free will from the Stanford Encyclopedia of Philosophy. That's, that, that was on your syllabus. Um, there's that uh, website naturalism.org which some of you uh, on the, the forums have noticed. Um, there's some nice links that one of your fellow students uh, posted um, and so on. Uh, have a snoop around, get on Google, type in free will, there's lots of cool stuff, there's lots of really bad stuff as well. Um, but I want you to take a position, I want to see an argument and I want to know exactly what your argument is, don't make me guess, um, and argue for it. Um, have some fun, uh, it's an important subject and uh, it's serious, uh, but it's also it's also fun to think about. Uh, so until then, um, I will see you and happy studying. Bye.